I'm Lisa Bilyeu and I went from housewife to co-founder the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. It's estimated that we will spend close to $19.6 billion on Valentine's Day. About 250 million roses are sold and approximately 6 million people will propose on this very romantic day. And yet, despite the fact that we all love to love, we still find ourselves with an approximate 50% divorce rate. And that's just data on people that choose to break up. Let's not forget the couples that are living in quiet desperation, or the couples that are suffering from bed death, or the couples that agree to stay together out of convenience. So today I wanted to do a different kind of show. I wanted to show that long lasting love does and can exist. But if you are looking for a quick relationship fix, then this episode isn't for you. But if you actually want to sustain a long lasting happy relationship and you're willing to be vulnerable and do the work, then guys, lean in. Because we're about to go deep into the no BS ways we can actually get what we want. Okay, so I've been married for 16 years and what I've learned is that love isn't a game of monopoly. There's no pass go and collect $200, it's not easy, you don't just roll a dice to see where you end up. It will take work, hard work. Now, I believe there are two fundamental things that we must address in this episode in order to make that dream relationship a reality. The first one, the very first one, before you do anything else, is you need to work on yourself. You can't bring negativity, low self-esteem and insecurities into a relationship and expect the other person to fix you. Okay, now once you've put in the self-work, then you move on to the second part of the equation. Once you've found a partner, I believe in order for you to really understand each other and grow together, you must be willing to communicate. You must be willing to open yourself up to being vulnerable. You must be willing to give, to receive, and to compromise, all while still being you. And so, today's guests have incredible insights on how to actually do both of those things. So, first up, I'd like to introduce to you the amazing Steph Papura. At the age of eight, she was sexually abused by an older neighborhood kid who threatened her life if she ever told a soul what happened. Being told and believing it was her fault, she spent her entire childhood blaming herself for everything that went wrong. From her parents' divorce to her father's abandonment to bulimia to cutting herself, she felt worthless. And so she bounced from one abusive relationship to another. How could someone love her if she didn't even love herself? How could someone value her if she didn't even value herself? It all just became a perfect storm that eventually turned into a tornado. Feeling lost and alone, she finally just had enough. She climbed into a motel bathtub. She took some rope, tied it around her neck, and dropped her legs. But the next morning, she came to, and the rope was untangled. Shaken and confused, she asked herself the defining and most fundamental question of her life. Should she give death another shot, or should she give life another shot? Well, over 15 years later, this incredible woman has put in the work, changed her perception of herself, and as a result, not only met the man of her dreams and built a family of five, but she's also co-founder of Powerful You with her husband, an incredible company where they both get to encourage others to see the power they have within themselves. Yes, it's safe to say this woman understands the importance of self-work and self-worth in a relationship. Okay, I'd also like to introduce you to the Woman of Impact alumni, the amazing and just overall special human, Emily Morse, who you may know as Sex with Emily. With a doctorate in human sexuality, Emily is a sex and relationship expert who shares her wisdom on her daily podcast and Sirius XM radio show, Sex with Emily. She's been named as one of Esquire's and Stylecaster's top sex and love podcasters. She's been voted as the number one dating and sex expert to follow on Twitter. She's an author, contributor to Cosmo, with appearances on The Today Show, The Doctors, NBC, CBS, and ABC, to name a few. Yes, it's safe to say this badass woman right here knows a thing or two about relationships. So guys, please welcome to a very special edition of Women of Impact. All wow. right, so we've got a, 
a lot to talk about, girls. And I think we need to start from square one, okay. which is how I said in the intro is, I think we as women need to work on ourselves first. In fact, not even women. I think people, in order to have a successful relationship, really need to work on ourselves. Because we bring in so much past into our current relationship. Things that happen in our childhood, bad relationships, we can't help but bring them into our new ones. And I think that that's our first fundamental mistake. So I'd like to start with you, Steph. You have a quote which just really hit me. Um, you said, don't let the fear of being alone be greater than your own self-respect. Love yourself enough to walk away from an unhealthy relationship. So let's talk about that, step one. Um, how did you come to that conclusion, especially based on everything you have gone through in your past? I think your past always dictates your future. And... I got to a point where I sat down and said, I've had enough and I don't want to be lonely and I don't want to be sad and I don't want to hate myself anymore, but I don't want to be with all these terrible people and to try to like define myself worth. Mm. I had to find that in myself and realize I was good enough to find somebody that would treat me amazing. Because initially, did you find that you were looking for that self-worth from somebody else? Absolutely. I wanted someone to love me so bad. Mm. Uh, my parents divorced when I was nine years old, and my dad didn't want to be a dad anymore. He left. Mm. So if the one person who's supposed to love you on the entire planet more than anyone else leaves, what does that tell you? Mm. I always believed I wasn't worthy of love because I couldn't get it from him anymore. And it, it shattered mm. me. Because I was, a, I was a true daddy's girl. I loved my dad. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to go everywhere with him. So when he left, it was like I was trying to seek validation and have someone just love me. I wanted to be loved by a guy because I didn't have that. And so I just sought out shitty relationships because that's what I thought I deserved. Do you find that a lot, Emily, in the people that you talk to? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I do, we are all destined to repeat things from our past, like childhood, you know, our parents' relationships. I mean, I feel like in a way, rather than fighting it, it'd be so great if people understood that we're all going to have issues to work on. So I would like hang on to people that felt familiar, like I was so afraid of abandonment that I would shut down. And I had to learn that after time. Either you keep doing it, or you check in and you go, you know what, this is no longer serving me. And then you stop and then that's when you keep doing the work. And I think it is a lifelong process. So yes, I find it all the time. You gotta do the work, hopefully, if you have the, those kind of mm -hmm. insights. Yeah. So yeah, it's very common. Yeah, that we repeat these things and then we gotta learn. Now, what I find fascinating and really impactful stuff about your story is, man, you hit, be, I mean, rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Like, let, oh, yeah. that's what, I couldn't even think of anything oh, yeah. more rock bottom than that. So if you don't mind just taking us through quickly that, that scenario, what, like how you felt about yourself and what that transition was to, in your mindset to then pick yourself back up metaphorically and actually physically um, and then start to shift your mindset of what your worth is. So I don't know how I survived it to begin with. I have no idea to this day why I'm here. Um, I woke up and I was really confused and I ended up getting in my car and driving to my mom's house and it was very clear that I had something happened. My neck was, had bruises and cuts across my neck. So I had to tell my mom what had happened and, um, I told her. And she looked at me and she's like, you have a purpose and you need to find out what it mm. is. And that really made me think, because at that point I was like, I still don't want to be here. Mm. No one loves oh, okay. me. I don't want to be here. And so I just kept living life and living life. And I kind of started dating people that weren't scary, but weren't safe. Mm. And I woke up one day and said, this is bullshit. Was it literally just like one day? One day huh. I woke up and I said, I'm done. I don't want to be this person anymore. I hate hating myself. I am with the most terrible people. Why am I doing this to myself? If you have a choice, choose differently. Mm. 
So I just had to choose differently. I started writing and writing about what I wanted in my life and what I wanted in a mate and how, I, how to be happy. Mm. And so I set out on this journey and I was, for the first time in my life, I was fine being alone. I was like, uh, I'm gonna be alone no matter what. Even if somebody I think is attractive comes mm. along, if they're not worthy of my love, I'm not gonna give it. So I truly just didn't want to date. So I met my husband and instantly he was like, let's be vulnerable and let's tell each other everything. And I put the walls up mm. because I was so terrified. And, you know, he would talk me into putting the walls out. So I'd kind of peek over the wall <laughs> a little bit. And he was the first person I told about being molested and everything. I finally just let him in. And we both were just broken, sad people. And we just wanted more for our lives. We wanted to be happy. We wanted to document our journey. We wanted to be more and have more and do more and just do great in the world and just have the most incredible marriage. Yeah. And we really do. We've been together for 15 years. Mm, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, to have come from what you've had to endure um, and then be able to change and adapt and grow as a human to be able to bring the best part of you to the relationship is amazing and I think that that's what's so hard for people right mm -hmm. is that they start from a place of not feeling worthy to be loved or they start from a place of um you know I mean let's in fact let's talk about being the victim right because initially oh, yeah. you get people that are always like why do I always find the wrong guy right? mm -hmm. and I bet you hear this yeah, all, all the, the time, time. Yeah, yeah I mean it's like I mean, here's the thing. That's why I said eventually, like, you're 50% of the equation. So if you mm -hmm. keep finding the wrong person, guess what the one constant is? It's like you. You it's keep you. showing up, yes. right? There is this notion in society that, that we, in our culture, that we have to find someone to complete us. Mm -hmm. That we are not complete mm -hmm. until we find someone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, I, felt my, I found my other half. And I think that is so wrong that we need to be our whole selves before we can truly attract who we want and who we want. And most of when I say whole, it's like, at least it's that self-love part. Not that you're not always working on it. Right. You're always working. Mm -hmm. But if you think this person's gonna complete me and make me happy and fill me up in all the ways I feel empty, all these empty holes, it doesn't work like that. So I you're think wrong. that's so beautiful. Yeah, that you'll eventually find... just crash. I mean, yeah. you'll be on that high of, I'm yeah. so in love, this is so amazing. And once your issues come in together, yeah. it's like, it's just not gonna work. That's why there's so many divorces and breakups and people are cheating because of how they feel about themselves mm -hmm. inside. Yeah. Not how you feel about each other. You could have two great people, but both very sad or both very broken. Right. Yeah. And you've got to you... heal yourself or you need to at least be on a journey if you're with someone to both want to grow. Yes. We never stop growing. And if one of us stops, we're like pulling each other's hand. Let's go. Let's keep growing. Let's keep trying and moving forward. Let's just not stay stagnant here. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do you begin to heal yourself, whether you're in a relationship or not? Because I actually do believe if you're trying to overcome something, having that support system is mm -hmm. major. And if you've got a partner that's also trying to, that can be really help. Um, but let's say you're not. Let's say someone's watching this right now and they desperately want to find love and they're listening. They're like, okay, I want to work on myself. Step one on loving yourself and stopping that negative talk is is I think it's being vulnerable with, with either you're finding your yes. people, finding your friends that you trust, and not even, I think it's best to do it outside of relationships. So mm -hmm. practice just, you know, finding a friend, finding a group, finding support in your community. So that for me was a main thing is through friends. And then also um, therapy. I think that therapy is, and, and here's the thing, I understand like therapy, people think it's, it's very overwhelming to people. How do I get, I can't afford it. But there's a lot of different ways to get therapy. Um, sliding scale, first of all, insurance, if that doesn't work for you, but also there's groups, there's AA, mm. there's Codependence mm. Anonymous. There's, there's a lot of different way, ways that you can find that community. And I think you learn through groups and through others how to really learn to love yourself and accept yourself. And then you learn what feels good and what doesn't. So then you start to shed toxic people around you. And you just, you, you truly do attract what you put out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know we all say that in different ways, but it's true. And then the more you refine, you refine and you're in touch with yourself and learn to love yourself mm -hmm. through therapy, through finding good people, through writing. Like I love what you said that you sat down and you wrote. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of power in manifestation and pen to paper. Mm -hmm. Not all this 
but you're writing it down in every day and you're manifesting, you're thinking and you're reading and you're speaking it. And I think that's a big part of it. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. And, and the other thing you said, like therapy, if there's people that are just like, I don't want to leave the house. I don't want right. to open up YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's so Thank many you. motivational, amazing speakers out there that can help you mm-hmm. listen to them all day long if you yeah, can't afford yeah. therapy or you just simply right. don't want to go. Yeah, you're, that's a really good point. For me, what I've had to work on is a lot of negative self-talk. So if I don't feel my constantly, whether it's reading or writing or feeling myself, if I'm driving just with positive self-messages, then, I'm, then my brain will take over. Mm-hmm. And so I think the more you can fill it up with all that stuff, that is great. Mm-hmm. I mean, therapy is, I think, where you do some good, like, one-on-one, but that stuff, positive message is so yeah. important. Okay, so it's very clear of, like, these are the actions I can take. What about the things that people don't realize? Like, you said toxic people and you said friends. So you turn to your friends. What if you don't realize your friends are the toxic people? Growing up, it was definitely, like, I had friends call me up and it's like, I know he's lying to me. Will you come and I want to drive by his house to see if he's cars there, right? Like, oh right, 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 right. Yeah. And look, that was obviously in my teen years, yeah. but you do even get that now yes. where people are making sly comments about certain people and it's that subtle negativity in your brain that you may not realize is actually holding you back from making that alteration in your life. I think you need to take a look around and see what your friends are and evaluate like your personality and their personality. And once you start growing, you notice negative yeah. people just fall out of your life. Mm-hmm. They are just they simply do. magically gone. Right. Because you're attracting something differently mm-hmm. and you're not going to wait for them to grow. You're just going to keep going. So be on your path, focus on what you're trying to get to and then as you do it, analyze the people around you so Absolutely. that you can see if they actually mm-hmm. do fit Absolutely. into that. And I love what she said about vulnerability because for me vulnerability was weakness. You did you were not going to I was not going to be vulnerable with anyone right. on the planet. I wasn't going to cry, I wasn't going to show any emotion. But vulnerability is powerful. It is. Yeah. Telling your story and not being afraid to tell your story and being you is power. Yeah, Brene Brown just did this. Oh, I didn't. I just watched the, her second <sighs> TED talk, <sighs> and she goes on about. I don't know if you've seen it, but her first one's about vulnerability, and then the second one is talking about her experience on the first one and how she was really embarrassed that she did the talk, and this was right after. And she's like, "Can I persuade YouTube to take it down? <laughs> like, what if four hundred people see?" 400 people obviously you got into the millions like a minute right and in that she said something that hit me more powerfully than her whole speech before she said put your hand up she asked the crowd put your hand up if when you're vulnerable you feel like that's weakness and everyone just like put their hand up she's like all right everyone's been at this event now for the whole weekend Put your hand up if you admire and respect the strength people had to be vulnerable to stand up on stage. And everyone put their hand up. She's like, okay, so vulnerability within yourself is seen as a weakness, but vulnerability in other people is seen as a strength. And I was like, oh my God, like that shit just rocked my world. I think Brittany Brown does so much work because no one really understands vulnerability, authenticity. It's such a buzzword now, which I think is amazing. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it is confusing. And I used to think, well, if I'm vulnerable, I, with friends, I've been able to be that. But, but with men, I was oh, much I'm, more oh, guarded. Yeah. I was like, Absolutely. I'm tough, men I'm independent. No I'm yeah. not gonna, and I love what your example of the over the wall, because yeah. you do one thing to me, the wall goes up, the wall goes up. It's hard to get it back down again. It is. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really good point. But I wanted to go back to one thing you said about the tips for people because Mm. this is something about friends like how do you know when something doesn't feel good I was just thinking about this is that when you leave somebody like let's say you have a group of friends or there's people you're out with truly check in with yourself and think how did it make me feel am I going home worried am I thinking that I said something wrong or like the the next time they ask you to do something are you thinking Mm. is this going to be a good time is this going to be weird like so the people there are certain people that you meet and it's just like you don't have that with them right away. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just like a, a, a check-in thing. Um, I don't know, about like the, the, yeah. the specific tip. It's like checking like in that, with yourself yeah. of how their energy it's fits with yours. Sense. And if it feels like something's off there, but it takes time sitting and slowing and thinking and evaluating. And, yeah. and the more good people you have in your life, yeah, you realize who is When toxic. I think that we need to stop, as a society, making other people's emotions about ourselves, uh, our partners, our friends, yeah. our bosses, our coworkers, everyone makes each other's emotions about ourselves. So for instance, I text you up or call you, I'm having a bad day. Oh my gosh, is she mad at me? 
<laughs> maybe you're just having a bad day. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you're stressed yeah. out. Always assume the best, but right. make sure it's not about yourself. Yeah. Right. That's, that's actually such really, a good point. Yeah, especially in a relationship. And that's really oh, interesting. Oh, it's huge in a relationship. And that's why it's so difficult to gr continuously grow we're in a partnership where um, if the other person isn't growing, I think it's very difficult to then be able to bond because A, you're just on different playing fields. Yeah, um, and then also, are you going to allow someone to change that mood that you're in? Like if you're feeling down, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. that there are days where we all have that. Yes. Where shit's gone wrong. We're just not feeling good about ourselves. And the question is the people we're around, going back to how mm -hmm. what you actually just said about yeah. friends, is our partner making us feel better or worse about it? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time though, it's dangerous to rely on them to do either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It it's, is. It's, it's, it's such. A, it's so tricky because we are told the way we're is that our, our partner should be everything. They should be our best friend. Mm -hmm. They should be our lover. They should fix the sink. They should take out the trash. They should go shopping with us. They should be everything. Yes. And that's not realistic to put all those expectations on one person, one partner in your life. Here's the tricky thing. Even if you have someone that's great, like a great human being, right? And you really do love them and they love you. There are going to be moments where I'm struggling, he's in a piss poor mood, right. right? It's just, it's inevitable. So in those moments, how do you, which I used to when I first met Tom, we would just like butt heads because mm -hmm. I'm freaking pissed about something completely different. He's pissed about something. And now those emotions are coming together and we're actually fighting each other now. And now it becomes about me and him when really it was about an issue I was dealing with and an issue he was dealing with. Because you're making with. your emotions about each exactly. other. Oh, fact, you're yeah, taking yes, on each yes, other's exactly. emotions. Yeah. <laughs> and you're making it about yourself instead of Tom's just having a bad day and you're just having a bad day or I'm having a bad day and James is having a bad day. Let's just let them have a bad mm. day. Let's just, we all get headaches. We all have bad days. We're all super busy. Yes. But let's just have that be the motion, not everything else from the past coming in and saying, this is how I should feel instead. Right. So then how do you do, when you guys are talking about those assumptions, how do you not make the assumptions? Like, I like this thing about like, how, like let me check a story with you. Like even with friends or in relationships, I'm feeling like when I came in today, you felt that you were annoyed, something else going on. Like mm. to ask questions about it so you don't go into assumption mode. Always assume the best. If you have like, you walk into a room and you just make, start making all these assumptions, well, your assumptions are wrong. Right. Yeah. I love, in fact, this brings us right down to um, perception, right? Because you did yes. this incredible video series about perception. Um, talk to me about that and why um, powerful you so focused on trying to change that perception in people in general. Because I think it spans from business to relationships to, you know, personal. Well, if identity. you're making assumptions, if you don't ask the right question, it's going to be wrong. Hmm. Right. And so if you're just if you just keep making the same assumption, 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 and you never ask the question, it's gonna be wrong. So your perception, it's just like your eyesight, it's in a limited field. Growing up in abuse, I couldn't have the right perception, mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't or see Or you had things. one perception, it just may not have been the accurate one. Yes. Or the accurate one. It was wrong, hmm. because I kept making assumptions. Interesting. So people need to start changing their perceptions and looking internally yeah. instead of making about everyone else. Yeah. And that goes to this, what I was saying, story like checking, like you know, sometimes we think that like our thoughts are coming from somewhere else. And then once you realize that my assumption or my story that I'm thinking about the situation, we go to the past, we go what something means in the future or the past. And then you realize that's my interpretation. That's actually not true. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times you have to be like, oh, I'm thinking that this thing's really bad, but it's not true. And then you stop and you're like, well, what do I know? Like, what are the facts? Like, you got to separate your, this is some way that I do it is when I have assumptions or I tell myself that someone's mad at me or someone did something, I think, well, the facts are that they just didn't call you back, for example, or that they, or they just, they're late. They're just busy. Yeah. They it forgot. doesn't mean that a bunch yeah. of other things are happening. So when you just go, wait, what are the facts? In this present moment, that's the way I've gotten my mind to kind of stop making assumptions and thinking things. I'm like, well, what? What is really, the, what can we all agree is the truth here? <laughs> the truth is Tom slammed the door and you were in a bad mood. Like right. that's it. And then it just takes you to that present, mm -hmm. which is where all we have. Mm -hmm. Or oh, someone's else. thinking about something that happened two weeks ago and you have no idea. You're just interpreting it. Is that a exactly. reflection of you or what you, you said just in that moment? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It never is. Most of the things we worry about are not even what's going on. Mm -mm. All right. So 
When we then get into a relationship and we bring all these things with us, we bring these assumptions with us, mm. how do we start to break that mold? So you've met this guy or girl, whatever your preference is, you've met your partner, you've worked on yourself, you found this person, and now you have to stay open to things coming your way because you're, going back to what you said, your eyesight is only this big. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole world behind mm -hmm. me that I haven't even looked at. How do you stay open to that when you've worked so hard on yourself? Because sometimes I think it's, it can be scary because you're like, I've done all this work. I don't want this guy or this girl, right. my partner, to derail me from all the work that I've done. How do you know what's actually a good move or a bad move? So I... So when we met, we went on a journey to become better. And we were all in love and everything was great. But you're, when your issues start coming in, mm -hmm. you start butting heads. And so we sat down and we just started talking about our issues. Is it my issue? Is it your issue? Are we oh. mirroring each other? Oh. Whose issue is it? So we would sit down literally wow. every single night in our room. We still do. And we talk about our issues, our problems, like what's, go what's really going on? Mm. You know, you were in a bad mood today, but what, what was that really about? Because your day was great. So what is really going on internally to make you feel that way? And that could go back to like something jogged your memory from the past and you start getting worried about something stupid, mm -hmm. like not the, the trash not being taken mm -hmm. out or something stupid, but it's really not about the trash. It's about something else from a long time ago triggered your memory. So mm. we sat down and started talking about our issues. Whose issue is it? We literally went through like the abuse, um, all of his past, and just clearing that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is communication. It's like knowing that's so amazing that you guys were able to communicate. It's like mm -hmm. learning really good communication skills. It's is everything. A skill. And there's a certain way to, to learn how to, there's something called Imago therapy, which I really what like. It? It's called Imago, I am I M A G O. Okay. But there's different variations of it. But essentially, it's if you're in a relationship, you try to, the guy have to confront you about something using feeling words like, babe, you are never on time and you're always, you know, I'm always mad at you, 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 and you blame them. Because the second you put someone on the defensive and you say, you, you, they shut, they don't hear the next mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. you say. But when you're like, it made me feel really disrespected when you were late. Mm -hmm. And I just want, you know, I want you to know how I'm feeling and, and it doesn't feel good. And then, then they repeat back to you. So what I'm hearing is that you said yeah. that you feel that, that me being late is what, what has upset you. And then I could say, yeah, that's what it is. And I, and I really don't want that to happen. Then your partner would say back, I hear what you're saying. And I'm sorry I've made you feel that way. Let me explain. I was running late. And then it's really just like a very specific, mm -hmm. I'm because no one can argue with your feelings. Mm -hmm. And repeating back and then saying it, I mean, it, it's, it's this beautiful process because really communication, I used to think I was a great communicator before I actually learned communication skills. What I meant was I'm very sociable and I like people yeah. and I love talking, right? Very, yeah. very different yeah. than being a good communicator yeah. or a good listener, all yeah. different. Yeah. I'm the life of the party. I don't know what the hell you said, but wasn't I fun? Yeah. But when you learn these things mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, okay, it's it's really good listening. It's it's re reporting back in a relationship. It's not just being easygoing and cool, right. like all that. It's yeah. really specific. And so I think in a new relationship, it's important. Your partner might not have these skills, but if they are interested in learning, you could, you guys could learn it together. You mm -hmm. could learn how to be effective communicators. Mm -hmm. So I think that is huge and it helps you with every kind of relationship. Right, and you said something, um, you said, it made me feel disrespected yeah. Yeah. when you were late. But I feel like you could only feel disrespected if you disrespect yourself because well, it's right. already in there. Because why mm. would you be feel disrespected if someone was late? They were just late, it was yeah. traffic. They were working, they couldn't get off in time. But why, what inside right. of you made you Wanted feel to so disrespected? Yeah. Okay, exactly. So that goes back to the childhood. So let's say yes. my partner said back to me, I'm working so hard. You know that I would never disrespect for you to be late. I'm like, every time you're late, you're late every day. I don't disrespect. Well, I can go back to, okay, well, where else do I feel this? Why do I always mm -hmm. feel like maybe people are yes. taking advantage of me in my life? You know, maybe it's them, maybe it's not. But I could, I could then I could say like, you're right, that way that wasn't disrespectful, but I've told you this, where else can I set boundaries around this? So maybe mm -hmm. then he's got to alter his behavior and realize that like time is an issue for me because in my past, then what therapy would do or friends would say, where do I feel disrespected? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? My mom was always late. She never picked me up at school at time when some, I've got some mm -hmm. issues around time. It's always layers. You're peeling back, you're peeling yes. back. You're, no, you gotta assume that if you're in a relationship or a friendship with someone that you love, 
they don't intentionally want to hurt you. Right. Yes. Even if they're the biggest jerk in the world, you're both And if they do, you're it. with the wrong exactly. person. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if they get off on that. Yes. But if they're truly like, babe, I did not want to be late. I swear. Then you know, like, okay, well, then how do we get to it? And then there's layers mm -hmm. and layers. That and that's what my healing. husband says to me. He's like, you know my intentions right. are true. So if I say something and I was wrong, you know my intentions are pure. And when he said that to me, I was like, you're right. He yeah. would never hurt me yeah. and he would never intentionally want to. Right. And that's exactly, I love that so much because that's exactly what I do with Tom. I use the word feel. So I say, I know you love me. I know you didn't mean to, but I did feel disrespected during yeah, this. Yeah. And then once you've identified, because what you're saying is look back in your life, mm -hmm. see where else you've been, dis you felt disrespected. Yes. And so what I do is I even say that in that conversation. So I'll say, I've realized that I feel disrespected because this actually happened in my past. I know it's something I need to get over, but right now, this is what I'm working through. Because you're never gonna be able to do it overnight. No. So I bring yes. my partner in and say, I'm gonna work on it. But for now, can you please not be late because it gives me this feeling. Exactly. And on the side, I'm going to work on it and eventually you can be as late as you like and I'm not going to care. <laughs> right. Right? But like right. giving yourself that leeway to be honest with your partner about why you're insecure, about why this has affected you, bringing them into it so you can do it together as a partnership instead of in um, right. solitary. That's such a good way to say it because mm -hmm. it, and what, what could happen if you don't have these skills, and I love that we're all saying it takes time, is that... What happens, and I don't. This, women do this too, but in a male, in a heterosexual relationship, men typically want to fix, which is what I hear from women every single day. Mm. They want. I, I went to my partner like, oh my god, well, I, I want to fix it. Like, like, then you should just. You know, if they come home from work and I'm upset about something, well, well, let me help you. You should quit your job. You should. You shouldn't talk to this person. Let me get you food. You know? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes, like, let me clean. Let me. No, yes. we just need you to listen. Mm -hmm. I need you to say, I hear that you're hurting. Mm -hmm. I hear that was a really rough day, babe. Tell mm -hmm. me more. And that's another, and we all need different things. Yes. yes and I'm not saying yes, men don't need that, that as well, really but true. teaching your partner how you need to be mm -hmm. loved. I love yes. that. How you need to be listened to, mm -hmm. what you need in these moments, because everyone's different. Maybe their last partner wanted more fixing, for example. Yeah. But a lot of times, they, for men, it's a typical thing yeah. that they don't, but let them know. It's so it funny. It makes you because feel loved when you listen. I used to get in arguments with Tom because I would go to him with a problem. I just want to hug. Yeah. I want his arms around me to say, baby, everything's okay. And yes. what he does, he's like, okay, so what did you do? But what did they do? <laughs> okay, so what did you do after? And now yeah. I feel like I'm being interrogated. Yes, yes. And I'm like, oh, yes. God, so now we've yeah. learned what we do and it's become a habit now. It took us a while to get there, but what we do is now when, if I go to him with a problem, I'll either remember and say, babe, I just need you to listen yeah. right now. Good. Or if I forget, he'll stop me. He's like, wait, 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 before you go any further, do you want me to listen or to fix it? <laughs> and I'll right. be like, okay, that's a good question. Yeah. What do I need right now? I just need, I need you to fix it. And he's like, all right, let's do this. Yes. You know, or whatever it is, but being open and telling yeah. him because that's so true. Understanding your partner. Yeah. I love it so much. It's true. And half the journey, I mean, so much of this is what do you need? What do you want? Mm -hmm. And figuring out what we want. Like, especially a big thing that I think can stop from self-love and all this stuff is, is being a pleaser. And so mm -hmm. you never think much. When you're a pleaser often, you care about, you're taking care of everyone else around mm -hmm. you. You think our needs come second or let, don't ever come, come last. So think knowing like, what do I need in a relationship? And that's why I think it's so important to write down what feels good to you, what doesn't when you're looking for a partner and then Absolutely. explaining it, what I need and that it's okay to have needs. Mm -hmm. and it's okay to ask for mm -hmm. what you want. Yeah. It's a big learning lesson. Yeah. How do you manage it? Obviously, you, you guys collectively have five children. You have five kids. So, and um, you're this so you have five person. kids. You're also running this incredible business oh, together. Um, how do you make sure that you and your husband have time together? Because I think whether it's kids that distract you or your business or things like that, I think it is very difficult to make sure that you guys prioritize yourself. And I think that's where people get into their problem of you meet someone, you fall in love, you mm -hmm. let the adrenaline and the excitement take over for a few years. And then before you know, you're spending less and less time together. And I think that's why you have the drop off and you have the divorce rate and you have the relationships that just don't last long. So in order to get to that 15 year mark, that 30 year mark, the 50 mm -hmm. year mark, which let me tell you, I'm gunning for the 50. Yes. Um, how do you manage that with kids and building a business? We are literally always together. <laughs> yeah. So we wake up really early. We meditate. We get the kids breakfast. We get them to school. I mean... And you do that together? Yes. Okay. So he'll start making breakfast and I'll start packing their lunches. We get them off to school. 
we go to work, our offices are next to each other. But then it's like he has his work, I have my work. But a lot of it, I mean, we have a company together. Mm -hmm. So we're always like in meetings together. And then, but the love time, it's just yeah. like the kids go to bed and we spend that time talking every single night at bedtime. What happened today? What were your takeaways? Mm -hmm. What are your issues? How are you feeling? And I think that's really important. And it really means a lot to both of us. And I feel like that's how our relationship has been so good because we've had so much communication. But yes, our life is crazy. And we're always running here and there. And you go here and I go here. And it, I mean, it is, it's chaos. Mm. But you guys have clearly structured your lives to make sure that your relationship doesn't fall through the cracks. And that's what's so important. 16 years in marriage, 18 mm -hmm. years with my husband, and mm -hmm. I still, every week, I actually don't do it daily, but every week I absolutely look at my, my calendar, I look at his, mm -hmm. I look at where we are in our relationship, and I'm like, what do we need to change yeah. this week to make sure we're connected? And in fact, this morning, I, I went up to him, and he, he, he has his headphones on, and he's working, and he pulls them out, and he's like, what's up? And this is the first <laughs> thing I've seen, I've seen him in the morning, so I haven't even said good morning to him. I walk over, he pulls him out, and he's like, what's up? And I was like, I just want to cuddle. Yeah. And he's like, oh. So he puts his headphones down and we cuddle, but you have to force yes, yourself to yes, do it. Yes. Because I'm tired, I'm stressed, I've got to shoot this morning. So the last thing I'm thinking about is bonding with my husband, mm -hmm. but I force myself to make sure I do. Mm -hmm. Because I may not feel it in this minute, but I may feel it, like I may feel the struggle in a week, I may feel the struggle in a month. And date your partner. I don't care how long you've yeah. been together. Go on a date, leave the kids, yeah. leave the dogs, leave whatever you got to, but make the time to spend with each other. Yeah, couples forget, and this is a huge, um, a huge topic on my show, a huge one of my main principles is that we have to learn when you're in a relationship that you have to prioritize your relationship, mm -hmm. whether it's your, you prioritize your pleasure, your sex life, your one-on-one -on -one time, because what happens, especially when you have kids and a business and a life, we think, well, we'll put that in the back burner because we're together, yeah. our sex life doesn't matter, we'll find time, well, time doesn't happen. So just as much as you schedule picking the kids up at work or your workouts or your friends, you need to look at it, I mean, scheduling date nights, taking time away from the kids. Couples need to do this as much as they prioritize their religion, their health, their workouts, everything else has to be like, here's two nights a week, we've decided we need just the two of us go into the movies or whatever you like. We go to dinner and you need that because when you have kids, people, I talk to couples all the time. I'm like, well, you, have you ever had a night away, for example? And they're like, oh, we've been together 10 years. Have you ever left the kids for a night? No, never. We can't mm -hmm. find babies. I'm like, you, you have, have to. to. You're stronger parents. You're stronger everything when you prioritize your intimacy. I'm too. so glad you happened oh, to have this hey, subject. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Sex. <laughs> sex. I know, there sex Emily brought up sex. Yeah. Well. Um, so because going from working on yourself to then when you meet someone to making sure that you're open. So now this is a beautiful transition yes. because Tom and I talk about our biggest fears in our relationship that could happen in the future. And bed death is one of them. Like you hear so many stories where couples have gone yep. for a year or two and they haven't slept together. Mm. And the, you hear people, they get excited for Valentine's Day. They get excited for their birthday because it means they're, they, they're owed. And when I say I couldn't imagine a no. worst case scenario, and here's the thing, I don't think people mean to. I think you end up like kind of blinking, yeah. especially like if you've got kids and you've got a business you and you've got family <laughs> or you're traveling. Or, but, but let's face it, you may not have kids, girl, but freaking oh, hell, yeah. you're doing so much oh, crazy yeah, stuff with I, your exactly. business. Exactly. So we all live mm -hmm. these lives where we're super busy and when we get home, we're in our safe space, we're in our comfort space. Sometimes we just want to let go, we want to veg out, we want to take our makeup off and be in the most ugliest, like our, our sweatpants that we love but has holes in it, right? Yes. And so you can't help but get into those habits. And sadly, what happens? You end up with bed death. Yes, exactly. Communication is a lubrication. That is like my main, if you remember anything, like it, my, on my tombstone, literally, it, talk about your sex life. Early and often, when you start having sex with someone, is when you should start talking about it. Like, like how what what turns you on? What feels good? How important mm -hmm. is it for us to have sex? Since here's the problem, though, in the early stages of a relationship, there's something called the honeymoon phase. That is a real mm -hmm. biological condition. Mm -hmm. Six months to two years, you've got the hormones, the bonding hormones. You feel the chemicals. You just feel like you're so in love, and all these things. You actually you look at the brains of people falling in love, lust. And mm -hmm. people going in on drugs, it's the same, right? But yes. that dies down. And then eventually you're like, 
well, we're not having sex anymore, but, but our, our belief system is that sex should always be amazing and it should always be perfect. And then when we no longer have that, we're like, oh my God, there's a problem. Well, I don't want to talk about sex because I've never talked about it. So let's just wait for it to come back. And then years go by, months go by, and then mm. nothing happens. So knowing this, knowing that sex is going to take work and it's going to take really honest communication, like knowing that going in and then continuing to have a dialogue, have a check-in about your sex life, talk about what turns you on, how it changes and keeping it top of mind. So in the beginning, everything is new. It's spontaneous. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. There's novelty. Well, after all that wears down, it becomes rote. It becomes predictable. It becomes, and that's, that's the, uh, that kills romance, mm -hmm. that kills sex, you know? Mm -hmm. So knowing all of this, then you keep talking about what's on our bucket list this quarter, this month. Like sometimes I think it's like a business. Like what do we want to, where do we want to be in our sex life a year from now? Our intimacy. Maybe it's numbers. Maybe it's we want to have sex three times a week. Maybe it's we want to try something different. We want to buy some new toys. Mm -hmm. We want to go on a sexual adventure. We want to role play. Sex toys. We want to talk to, we want to dress up for each other. Like people don't even know what's on the menu of sex because they're, it's shrouded in mystery for many. Mm -hmm. And I think it's embarrassment like, oh, and shame though, right? shame and trauma. What a two out of five women have trauma and it's like many don't, ever seek treatment for it, or you push it down, you repress it, and it doesn't, it just stays with you for a lifetime unless you learn to heal and yes. you go to therapy and you talk about it. Yeah, people think you don't talk about it, it's just gonna go away. It does, it's nothing not goes go away. away. Whatever you resist mm -hmm. persists and yes. all, you repress it, it just gets worse. So mm -hmm. so that's huge that you've learned to overcome fact, that. Can you, to could you actually like, give us some tips? But like, how do you go from having, an, um, you know, basically trauma. being, you know, yeah. sexually abused to then overcoming it and then being able to enjoy it with the partner? Um, I didn't enjoy it for a long time. I didn't enjoy mm. it until I met my husband because I felt like the men I was with, that's what they wanted. Mm. So if I, I thought if I gave them what they wanted, then it was going to be okay. Right. I didn't like it. So how I didn't you, like sex. How do you transition then? Because that's the relationship talking about what you want and what feels good and and the connection that you feel is so much with someone and the bond is going to be your sex is going to be so much better with your partner than just some stranger you met yeah. so finding a safe place having somebody that really can see you for mm -hmm. you first yes. to then allow that safety to open mm -hmm. up yeah mm -hmm. and then also like there is shame around sex and since we don't see it anywhere we're not taught in schools about we're taught, like, you know, it's all fear-based sex education, if you have any. Yes. We're told, use condoms. Use condoms and don't get don't pregnant. Don't get an it's STG. Such, yes. such, like, there's no I pleasure. There's no about talk that. about pleasure. There's no mm -hmm. talk about masturbation. Mm -hmm. There's no talk about women, yeah, about your bodies about and what that. feels good. We're, most women are oriented towards pleasing our partners and that doing what they want and that our pleasure will come mm -hmm. at some point or not at all. So my biggest homework for, for women all the time is you have to pleasure yourself. You have to masturbate whether you're in a relationship, whether you're out of a relationship. If you don't know what makes you feel good, nobody else is gonna be able to figure it out for you. That was until I was like 20 and I was having sex and I said to my friend, my girlfriend's in college, my and I said, what is the big deal with sex, by the way? Like, I like the cuddling part. He comes in, he's pounding away. But like, it doesn't feel great. No. And my friends were like, haven't you had an orgasm? I was like, what is an orgasm? I didn't even know what an orgasm was. They're like, well, don't you masturbate? And I said, oh. no. And that for me was this light bulb moment where I was like, well, no one taught me and I didn't know. And so I realized that I used to believe someday my prince will come and so will I. Because he's gonna, <laughs> you know, like, he... <laughs> That's amazing. He's going to ride up in a white shiny horse because he's going to have all the secrets to my body because I didn't learn anything. I thought mm. men knew. Right. And then I realized, the men's, teach, men's going to teach you. Yeah, but they, to, yeah. I thought they were shipped off to some secret school where they learned all about female pleasure and they would know my body because I knew nothing. And I was in a, my family was like, it was open. Then my mom was like, if you have questions, ask me about sex. But I never knew what the questions were. I think that's right. a big thing. We don't know what to ask. Mm. And we don't even know that it's possible to give ourselves pleasure, to have a lot of orgasms, to even ask for what we want. So the, the thing is figuring it out and then knowing that like we're both in a sexual relationship with, with somebody else. So thinking that either we have to fix the relationship on our own if it mm. comes to sex or they do. Like I get calls every day from Lizard, like my wife no longer wants to have sex, we've been together 10 years. Or a man calls in, same thing every day, you know, a lot of times. And it's like, 
first of all, you don't have to solve it on your own. There's two of you creating your sexual mm -hmm. relationship. So you both have to be willing mm -hmm. to talk about it and to work on it. And many people are not. Like even in long term, been together, we still hold on to this whether it's from religion, spirituality, wherever we grew up, that it's it's the messages from culture we talking about it is wrong. And so it's teaching couples and individuals that talking about sex is the hell is the first step towards actually having the sex life, the pleasure, mm -hmm. the intimacy that you want, is being okay with it. And how much do you notice the correlation between the healthy sex life and then the longevity of a relationship? It's not healthy for couples to say, well, we're best friends, we've sworn sex off. Because what I've also heard from those mm -hmm. couples is eventually they're like, well, I have no libido. I don't care about it. And then they realize I no longer have it for my partner, but we were not connected at all. And then that's when affairs happen. We're not getting our needs met. Mm -hmm. So I went to find someone else and oh, look, there's my libido. Cause it was attraction and intimacy that we yeah. no longer mm -hmm. nurtured. You have to nurture these kernels in the relationship all the time. I think that you have to continue to be intimate. And I'm never gonna tell you numbers, like it has to be once every day or once a week. People always wanna know what's the secret thing. And I will not. I'm not going to tell your girlfriend. Why do people always want to know numbers? They, they want to know. That's why. And I then they compare to their friends. How many yes, times do you guys have right? married? Times a week do married you have friends? Sex? Yes. Don't do that. Time. It's unhealthy. I've done it before as well. I know you all married people do this to but, each other. <laughs> yes. It's not healthy because you compare it and then you feel bad. Because listen, our brain is the largest sex organ. We have to keep sex top of mind, especially for women. So if it's off your mind because you're busy, we're stressed, anxiety, biggest killer of our sex drive, mm -hmm. then take time to like. Get into your body, take a dance clap, move, feel, take a bath, touch your, just be, breathe, like all those things that breathe, masturbate, I'm telling you, but watch feel, porn, I'm cool with it, get it, I'm energy, cool bring the, it. keep the pilot light but lit, keep it lit. Um, so, okay, so we've touched on the sex, but what about the romance? Because here's another uh, thing that I yeah. find, you've got couples that the woman's like, he's not romantic. I, he doesn't even buy me flowers. I can't believe it. Like, you know, um, or, you know, I better get flowers on Valentine's Day. But yet they're, they're not necessarily willing to do what their other half wants if it comes to sex. And it becomes, starts to become like a tit for tat, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, if you buy me flowers, I'll give you sex. If it's Valentine's Day, then, mm. right? And I think that that is extremely dangerous. Very dangerous. Um, but at the same time, I also understand that men, a lot of men, in fact, I don't want to generalize, my husband doesn't necessarily think about romance. So I just take it upon myself instead of judging him, like, oh my God, I can't believe he's not romantic. He doesn't buy me flowers. The truth is he's so busy. If it's important to me, I need to take ownership. So what I literally do on Valentine's Day, I'll say to him in advance, all right, babe, yeah, I want some flowers this year. So remember, and I'll put it on his phone, I'll get his phone, I'll set an alarm, like, remember to buy your wife flowers. Um, because it's like, I really want yeah, it. And yeah. I want him to know that it's important to me, but I want him to go and do it. And assuming that people are going to do it off their own back, I think just sets people up for, yeah. for failure because they're not mind That's readers. Right. Yeah. They don't know what you like right. until you tell them. Yes, yeah. you yes. co-create romance, you co-create Valentine's Day, you co-create your sex life. Mm -hmm. It's not one for the, so let's say, going back to the sex number thing, and then also is like, if someone wants it five days a week in the relationship, but someone wants it one, well then clearly you gotta figure out maybe three and a half times. Cause no one's right or wrong there. If you want it five times a week and you only want it one, you can't just say, well, I, my way's right once, forget it, live with it. Yeah, you just too bad. can't. Yeah, you can't, you have and to And the find flowers it. thing, we don't tell our partners what we want. And so I love what you're saying, Lisa. It's such a good example because there's a lot of women listening go, nope, he better know I want flowers. He knows I love flowers. And if he, telling him takes all the fun away. I don't want to have to tell him. And, and people say the same thing about scheduling sex. Like, that's the least sexy mm -hmm. thing ever. I'm like, well, let me tell you why it's not. Because mm -hmm. all the nights that you're coming home and trying to have sex with your partner and then you feel rejected because he's too tired, What's better, knowing that Saturday night is the night that you're having sex, so you can look forward to it, and you both know, and you talk about what you want to do, or every night you're like, oh God, I hope he doesn't try to have sex because I don't want to, or vice versa. Mm. So much better. Or how about you on Valentine's Day, February 13th, you're going, you better fucking remember this year. <laughs> yeah. If he doesn't give me flowers, but now you know. And then you have a time to be with other things, just to talk about all these things. And I think for Valentine's Day, it's a huge thing. Like, cause some people want flowers. Some people are like, no, don't spend any money. Let's mm -hmm. sit home and like watch Netflix and get our right. favorite cake, take cake, yeah. carry out, delivery. Yeah. So why not discover together what is Valentine's Day look to you, babe? What does it look like to me? And let's create it. Because a lot of it isn't natural. You know, yes. a lot of the stuff yeah. isn't natural. Like we're not naturally romantic or even naturally sexual for a lot of us. I mean, we are, mm -hmm. but we've repressed it or we've, we're busy, we're anxious, we can't deal with it. But knowing that it's important, how do we work our, our 
relationship together and our lives together so we can make all these things happen, knowing mm -hmm. what it is that we both want. Mm -hmm. To feel right. loved, to feel accepted, to feel adored, to feel cherished, you know? So how do we get that? Yeah. And then adding to something you had said was having that discussion with your partner, saying, hey, this is what I'm like, this is what you're like, okay. But then checking in with each other often to see if you've changed. Because I used to say to Tom when I first met him, no, flowers on Valentine's Day, it's so freaking cheesy. Like everyone expects it. I want you to buy me flowers because you've just had a lovely thought about me. I don't want you buying me mm -hmm. flowers because you feel like you should. Yes. The meaning behind the flowers isn't yeah. like, so I'm not actually into flowers. In fact, don't buy me flowers on Valentine's Day. But then I changed my mind. <laughs> right. 10 Get years back. down the line on Valentine's Day, I was like, I kind of want flowers. And he didn't get me. So I was like, okay, well, the poor man, of course he's not going to get me. I told him not to. Right. Yeah. So now I need to approach him and say, hey, babe, I've actually changed my mind. And it's taken a few years for him to remember because he spent 10 years trained not to. Yes. And now he's just like, please remind me every year because I'm going to forget. And so now I'm just reminding him every year. Hey, babe, I want flowers this year. Um, but like not being ashamed or embarrassed yeah. to say it out loud. Keep yeah. taking, keep having the conversations. I think that is such a good point that especially in long-term relationships, what you liked at the beginning Romantically, sexually, intellectually, whatever, yeah. vacation, everything changes, right? Yeah, we're so always changing as people. We're going to want different things. We're going to like different things. We're yeah. going to need different needs. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to let your partner know what those needs are because, yeah. like I said, like. And going back to the bed death. Exactly. Yeah. Going back to the bed death thing, oftentimes we don't realize that we've changed what turned us on or what we liked or. And there's so many different ways to experience pleasure that if you're always like, let's say you guys figure out your position, right? Like this is how we all get off and then we go off our day. You have to keep working at it. Just like if you do the same exercise every day with your body, you're not gonna have any improvements in your, right? You keep lifting weights right, the same way. Cool. But that's like something that people don't think about. They're like, they think like sex should be magical. Angels, fairy dust, always perfect without having to work it. Mm. Is a tip mm -hmm. of not you guys yeah. happily married and stuff. No, but, but many no, but, people. But here's the thing, even, I would absolutely say I'm happily married, but I mean, shit, See, like I'm still live. learning every day and yeah. still figuring it out. And we're yeah. still working on it. And it's yeah. just okay. because you're happy, you get to a point where you're like, we're happy with each other. It doesn't mean we're gonna stop. Right. We're gonna keep going so you can maintain that happiness together. Mm, so and cute. you're not ended up getting divorced or seeking things in Outside another person yeah, yeah. Yeah. that you're not getting in your relationship. Ah, yeah. oh, guys, this has been so amazing. I've had so much fun. So fun. Um, we could do like a whole series, I think, on this. Thank you so much for coming Thank and you. being a part Thank of this you. discussion. Hopefully we've actually, you know, made a dent in people that are watching and listening on the next steps to really like build a, a relationship that can last for life. So um, where can these guys find you online and what do you consider your superpower to be? Um, I'm at Sex with Emily everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the places. And it's my podcast and Sex with Emily and Sirius XM. My superpower is... Um, it's sex. I, <laughs> superpower is well, I believe that I'm the sex whisperer. That someone got, sex I'm a sex whisperer. Yeah, you can tell We're me what you, I can Instagram figure man. out what you need. <laughs> like if we talk for five minutes, I know you're. I know what you're gonna need. Oh, you can have to figure it out. man, yeah. awesome. And Steph, um, you can find us at powerful-u.com. We will also be having an event in LA. Lisa will be speaking yeah, at it. Yeah, I am speaking. Yes. Excited. Um, and and uh, what is your superpower? My superpower is my heart. And I think it's because I kept it hidden away for so long mm. that I just want to speak from my heart and love. Guys, guys, guys. Oh, my God. I've had so much fun today. Um, relationships is something I'm very passionate about. As I said earlier, I've been married for a long time, but I'm still learning and evolving every single day. And so I think that in meeting um, people along my journey, the one thing that people keep coming back to is they want a relationship to... Um, a happy relationship. They want something that actually makes them feel fulfilled when they're with them and when they're by themselves. And what I love about these two women is it was no holes barred. They really laid it on the line of what it actually takes to get there. Like no BS, not pretending, oh my God, I have a perfect relationship, but like the real honest thing of what you have to do, what you have to do in your life to change in order to have that relationship that you want. So um, hope you've paying attention, go follow these guys. If you're not following me, at Lisa Billy, go over to Instagram now. If you're not subscribed, click that little subscribe button down there. And until next time, guys, go and be the superhero of your own life. Thank you for joining us. Peace.
What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.